Welcome everyone. This is Robin Duncan, and this is our A Course in Miracles church service. Today, our topic is called Identity Crisis. Let's go ahead and get started with an opening prayer, taking a nice, deep, relaxing breath. Just leaving that outside world outside as we turn within to the center of the self. God is within us. We are within God. Both are true because there is no separation. Today we claim our true identity in your name, humbly, gratefully, gladly. <laughs> Thank you for forgiving us our illusions. Thank you for showing us what is real and true. Thank you for keeping our true identity intact while we wandered away in our mind only. But that was enough to cause us to be traumatized, terrorized, brought on much fear, anxiety, worry, and pain. Dear God, we have no use for this. Your will is done and your will is sufficient and we have no other will. May your will bless us forever and ever. Amen. Well, this whole idea of identity crisis is about your true identity. In A Course in Miracles, it teaches us that somewhere along the way, we decided that we could be something other than that which we are. Now, the good news is what we are. We are as God created us. God is the cause. We are the effect of the cause. We are much like the rays of the sun to the sun. And if you could imagine that the rays of the sun cannot decide to be something else, they are simply the effect of that beautiful source of light. And that's what we are. We are an effect, but good for us because being the effect of God, the creator of all in all, that is pure love, pure light, pure goodness, absolute perfection. And we get the honor of being the holy, precious child of this. We are eternal spirit. We are free of all limits. He created us to know his love in every aspect of our lives, to be happy, to rejoice, to know all things, to be all knowing. Do you know that when we leave this body, we actually reclaim our capacity to know all things? You can just think about one thing and you know it all. You could think about one person and you could know their whole life, past, present, and future. This is what we have forgotten, that we as the holy children of God have this great capacity. And that which we are is perfect. What he created is perfect, lives forever, invulnerable, all-powerful, and one with himself. He says that he created us to be his companion. I think that's really sweet. Almost like our children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, they are our companions as well. And even our little furry loved ones as well. We love our companions. It's wonderful. But somewhere along the way, we decided or, or accepted into our holy mind that we could be something other than this, other than what God created. Now, if God created everything and it was good, and we are that, that goodness. And he created no opposite, no opposition. There's no other choice. There's no door B, right? There's just A and we're it. And let's say that we're hanging around in heaven or whatever we did. And almost like teenagers, I think about teenagers because we're always like thinking about what if and what if, what happens if, you know? But somewhere he says we played what if. What if we could be something else? And then we got lost in it. So imagine if you are everything and you are perfect and you are whole and you are complete and you are all powerful, all knowing. And now you're playing around with the idea that you could be something else. What's on the table? You look on the table, there's nothing else. God created nothing else. And so we had to actually imagine that we could be something other than everything something other than the light. So now all we're really left with in my 
observation is we are left with the absence of something, the absence of everything, the absence of oneness, the absence of love, the absence of light, the absence of knowledge, the absence of health, the absence of abundance, the absence of happiness. So for that fleeting moment of time, let's say we said, okay, what if we were that? And then that crazy little gift that we have <laughs> is that we are the holy children of God. And when we play around with an idea, poof, there it is. We're looking at it. And you know you can do this because you do this in your nighttime dreams. You know you can create a whole alternate world in your mind. And you will not even know that it's not real until you go to another level of consciousness and go, oh, oh, that was a dream. Because we are so good at this. <laughs> so good at imagining what is not true and what never happened. Just think of this in your nighttime dreams. Are you not really good at conjuring up some story? It doesn't even need to make sense, but it seems to be true while you're looking at it. So he says, that's what we did. We accepted we could be something else, but there is nothing else. So we were left with scraps, really scraps of nothing. And that's what our ego is. Our ego is the part of our mind that's holding that false image of ourself in place. And so we gave our ego this task of saying, you know, hold this in place, this illusion, this false identity, hold it in place just a little while because I want to see what that looks like, you know. But if you experience that, which you are not, it's terrifying. Can you imagine at one point you knew yourself to be the all of everything with complete and total knowledge, deeply and completely loved by God? You know, they say in heaven that even the grass sings to you. <laughs> Wherever you go, you have a relationship with every single thing around you. And now you are a body in your mind only. You are this little splinter of a body trying to do the best you can with 50, 60, 70, maybe 100 years on a good day, right? Maybe a little more if, if you're lucky, I guess. But now we see ourselves, remember, we're the absence now of all the good stuff. So, of course, we are here too. Our true self is always here. So he says, even here, we see a, an aspect of our true self here. So we still see love. And then we see the absence of love. We know what that looks like. We see abundance, of course, but then we see the absence of abundance. We know what that looks like. We see health and we see the absence of health. Now our holy mind is split because we still know that which we are, but we have consented only, just consent, given a little home in our mind to something that never happened. But remember our crazy little gift? <laughs> is we can actually imagine something happened and then we can project it as if it occurred. And then when we look at that idea, it is terrifying. So now instead of eternal life, which you still have and is always yours, we have blocked our mind to that idea and now we die. At least we think we do until we find out we didn't, right? But we're all trying to not die, you know, stay younger, look younger, be younger, try to stretch out those years because in our mind, we've accepted there's this little lifespan on this little body and we've got to savor that. We've got to make the best of it because we think that is us. Well, the problem is this. When we accept a false identity, it's really no big deal. It's not much different than you deciding right now that you are a purple zebra. You could imagine it. Just imagine right now a purple zebra with your cute little face on his little head, right? Your cute little face, purple zebra. Who cares, right? It doesn't matter. Except when you're the holy child of God and you actually believe that you can do this and you can be something else, you actually experience it as if you did. And the worst part is this. This is the biggest problem of all. You forget who you really are. And when you forget your true identity, you forget God, you forget your home, you forget your people, you forget your safety, you forget your abundance, you forget your happiness, you forget your love. And now you're running around in this world that you have made trying to look for it, trying to get it back. Well, of course, I mean, 
who wouldn't? So this isn't about judgment. It's about an awareness that somewhere in our mind, we said we could be something other than what God created us to be. And that decision was a lousy decision, <laughs> as we well know, because God gave us everything. With God, there is no opposite. With God, there is not a trace of sorrow. With God, there is no darkness. With God, we can experience anything and everything whenever we want to, without limit. He gave us everything. So now we're wandering around in this false idea of ourselves with this false identity. And I call that an identity crisis. And it is a crisis because while we accept this little self that we have made, this little splinter of this being, the bigger problem is that we deny our true self. And when you deny your true self, you get to buy the whole bouquet of illusions. Not only can you be sick, but you can be broke. Not only can you be broke, but you can be alone. Not only can you be alone, but your spouse or partner can be unsupportive, you know, and on and on it goes. So not only did we abandon the good, the light, the great of everything, now we're stuck with duality and on a good day, it's mediocre, right? It's a little this, a little that. A Course in Miracles teaches us again and again, truth and illusions are irreconcilable. When you accept one, you forfeit your awareness of the other. Truth and illusions are irreconcilable. You can't ignore this because if you're trying to know the truth of who you are, and you're also still accepting this false self that you have made, you are going to feel stuck. You are going to feel like nothing's working, nothing's happening, God's not listening. You'll feel like God has just abandoned you in the middle of the street. And you get hit again and again and again. God has not abandoned us. In essence, we have abandoned God. In truth, we never can. But by denying our true self, we are now in self-denial. And that's a really big problem. Now, what do we do? Because we're kind of wandering around in this made up world, freaked out by it, of course. But thank goodness, God said, you know, I don't know exactly why you would make that choice, <laughs> why you would choose to be something other than you are, but so be it. He said, I'm going to give an answer to something I don't even understand. It says that God says like, I don't know why you would do this, but I'm going to give you an answer anyway, because I love you. And he gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a guide for us that represents a bridge of consciousness that goes from the absolute realm of God knowledge, our home, our true self, the one that we forgot. Holy Spirit has that in hand, never forgot. And the Holy Spirit also knows that we have accepted ourselves as these bodies that can be sick and they can suffer and we can be without and we can feel deprived and the holy spirit loves us completely and he gave us jesus the manifestation of the holy spirit he even gave us jesus in our dream to show us look look they even tortured me killed me and i'm still here he wanted to show us that you're not this body look who you are look who i am we are this and we didn't really catch the message because the crucifixion was so terrifying. Most of us, that's all we think about. But he really wanted us to understand the resurrection. He wanted us to understand who we are in the midst of this world. And so it's kind of like he took the shots of the worst so he could show us, you're not that. You are this. You are the Holy Son of God. All you have to do is accept it. And it's done. It's already done. It's been done. So it's tricky, isn't it? Because we look out with the eyes on this body we have created and our eyes make us believe that the impossible has happened. And yet it hasn't. If we have a dream tonight that we're all sitting here right now and, you know, somebody's phone rings and they run out of the room and a siren goes by, it might look like all of that just happened. And if we woke up tomorrow morning, we would say, oh, 
so funny. I had this dream, just like I was having the class yesterday and then I was having it last night. So weird. And we just move on and we don't think twice about it. Doesn't it dawn on you that if you can do that at night, doesn't it make sense that you can do that during the day? He says, you're still dreaming. You're not letting yourself wake up all the way, but you will because your guide is perfect. And the Holy Spirit, the teacher of peace is going to show you your way back from the illusion that was so scary. And he's going to do it with great love. And he's going to pace with you. And he's never going to pull you or push you or prod you or poke you. He's going to wait until you want that. And that's all you want. We get bogged down because in the dream that we have made, there's a lot of problems, right? We know there's a lot of problems. And every one of those problems is our ego's attempt at persuading us that the impossible did occur, that you are this body and you can be sick and you can suffer and you can die and there's nothing you can do about it. You are powerless and you are at the mercy of the world around you. We gave the ego that function so we could have this little thing that we're having right now. But you know what? We can take it back too. We can remind the ego who's boss. The ego is just serving a function. That's all. The ego is the representation of a false belief system. That's it. It's nothing else. It's not like a big beast that we have to fight. Some call it the devil or Satan. And we must remember that when we are fighting our ego, it will feel like you're fighting the devil because you're fighting something that represents the opposite of you. That's a really big idea. If there could be or would be an opposite of you, do you realize how big that would be? And if that represents darkness, do you realize how encompassing and horrible that would be? You would need the biggest dragon slayer whip you could find. Fortunately, it's not true. But in the dream, it looks true. It feels true. And then we use what we see and what we hear to validate it again and again and again. So what do we do? First of all, we have to go to our guide because our guide is the one that's going to show us our way back all the way through. We get bogged down because every time we look out at another holy child of God that we have put in our dream as a figure in our dream, every time we look at them and we see them as less than whole, less than perfect, less than loving, less than joyful, less than responsible, less than amazing at everything, we have just bought the story again, courtesy of our ego, and we have just reinforced that separation is real, that the impossible did happen. And so we have now all these people in our dream, and they're all crying out in the dream for us to validate them as imperfect. Some don't look quite right, do they? And some don't sound quite right. And some don't seem to be so loving. And, and some just are quiet. And some are withdrawn. And we always have an opportunity to judge people in our dream. That's what they represent. They represent the error in our mind. Not that they're bad people. But do you notice almost everyone you look at, you could probably find a flaw somehow, somewhere, right? You probably could if you let your ego do the looking, it would find something because that is the goal. That is the game. Find the flaw, find the guilt, find the imperfection, because what that does is it reinforces your false self all over again. If we are the dreamer of our dream and we are looking at the world that we have made that is not real, that never occurred. And if we validate what we see as reality, Ooh, we have just accepted all over again that the truth is gone. God is left and this is who we are. So what do we do? We have to remember who we are in the midst of every decision, every breath you take. It sounds like a lot, but not really. You know who you are in the dream. How much do you forget your own name? what you look like. You probably don't think about it much, but you probably never fully forget it, do you? Who you are in this dream. But that's not you. 
you have to get as good at remembering who you are in truth as you have been at remembering who you are in the dream. And when that happens, it's all good from there. So we have to switch teams. We have to reclaim our true identity. He showed me once, he said, it's almost like you have this trust fund at the bank and it has everything, not only the money, the resources, but it has the love and the health and the happiness, the well-being, the relationships, everything you've ever wanted because God gave you everything. That is your trust fund. And he says, but you don't remember your name. You go to the bank and they say, how can I help you? And you say, well, I'd like to collect on my account. And they say, sure. Who are you? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And they say, well, come back on another day when you know who you are. We have to remember who we are and underlined and, and we have to choose to remember who everybody else is. Sounds hard. It's not as hard as it sounds. Just think if that's your only goal every day in everything you do, remember who you are, remember who they are. Do not decide against anyone and the glory of God within them and their right to divine inheritance and happiness and blessings of God. That's your only goal. It's not so hard. If somebody comes up to you and, you know, they're, uh, they throw their gum out right on the sidewalk and, and you step in it and you're like, oh. <laughs> your temptation would be like, ah, oh, this person, what's it trying to convince you of? There's no love. Nobody cares about you. People are asleep, walking asleep. Be careful of what you say yes to because your ego is constantly like, judge them, judge them. See them as less than perfect. That's all we need to keep this going. So what do we do? You step in the gum, right? Pause, refuse to judge and say, God, you decide about the gum and all that. <laughs> I'll take care of that. But my part, you're telling me, God, my part is to remember who they are. I will not use what I just saw with my eyes to decide against the holy light of God within them. They are not this image I have made that is thoughtless and careless and just caused me a problem. They are as you created them. They are the ones you love. They are not this body. They are eternal spirit. They are one with me and they can only bless my life. Please give me the vision to see the truth. Now, it doesn't need to be that long. I'm just giving you lots of words to work with. Why do we do that? We do that because it's very likely in the future that that will never, ever happen again. We do that because it's very likely in the future that you will actually know who you are and you will blow open the door to the blessings that God already gave you. It's very likely that you will walk into that bank where your trust fund is and you will say, I am the holy child of God. I'm here to enjoy my account. I am that. And so is everyone else. And I will not let it go. I will not see them as less. I will not use this crazy little game that I gave my ego to preoccupy my mind with to get me to find the flaw so that I can be imperfect another day. And it's very likely that whatever problems I am facing personally, simply from standing up to the person with the gum, it could very well be that my healing is today. It could very well be that I don't get sick anymore, right? You have no idea, or maybe you do, I'm not speaking for you, most probably have no idea the power of what is being presented here today. This is a game and we gave our ego the rules and we said, Hey ego, whenever I start to remember who I am a little bit much, I mean, take Deborah, she's writing all these books. She's enlightening little children. She's bringing them beautiful messages, helping them be empowered and wham, ego comes on with that sickness and then another one and then another one and then another one. And she's just like, you know, those punching bags where they're just like, boom, 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 just like that. Why? She was getting a little too close to remembering who she was. Did that stop her? Maybe for a little bit. It's hard, right, Deborah? It's hard. And that's no judgment on you. It's just that it works. Why does the ego do it? It works until it doesn't. 
until you're laying in bed and you're actually feeling this ridiculous pain or you're uncomfortable and you lay in that bed and you say, God, true, I'm feeling pain and I'm highly uncomfortable, but I will not use this pain to decide against who I am and my right to everything because you gave it to me. You say it's mine. I will not use this sad story of myself to deny who I am. So you decide about the pain, God. You decide about what happens with all that. My part that you're asking me to do is not let go of who I am in truth. And if I will do that and I will not let go of who anybody else is, even if I feel this doctor over here is the one that caused it, I've got to get them over here in my circle of the mind and I've got to remember who they are too. Not hard once you get used to it. And then I'm ready because now God and I, we agree with who I am. God and I, we agree with who the doctor is, right? We agree. There's no disagreement. Now I'm ready for my teacher of peace, the Holy Spirit, to decide for me about the mess that I have made with my mind. Do you see that until I withdraw my investment in my own sad story, and that's no judgment on anyone, I have my own, believe me, my own sad story until I withdraw my investment and I recast my investment in my true identity so I'm no longer in identity crisis. Now, God takes the final step. And that's where the fun really begins because you might think, well, why can't God just, you know, rescue me from <laughs> this sad story way over here? And he says, you know, I rescue you every day, but I can't rescue you completely until you're done with that sad story. I'm not here to think for you. You have to actually want to remember who you are. You have to want it above everything. In fact, you have to want it instead of everything. Why do we want it instead of everything? We want it instead of everything. Just think you don't lose because God gave you everything. So when you remember who you are and what you are and what you have a right to, do you realize it comes with the bouquet of everything? So we don't have to worry about everything over here. You're not going to lose anything. You're just going to lose what you didn't like and what you didn't want. So let that be, lay that down and just one goal. Who am I? And who is everybody else? No other goal. And your ego will say, well, Robin, you can't do that because, you know, you've got a, you've got this meeting today and you've got this business to take care of. And you have, you know, you have this advertising you have to look at and you have this report you have to take a look at. Okay. It doesn't mean we stop living our lives. But if everything you do in the illusion, you use it to remember who you are. That's how we do it. Let this be used for the memory of my true self. And don't ask who you are. I made that mistake. Declare who you are. Own who you are. Walk in who you are. And if you don't know it, know it anyway. Because the Holy Spirit is the reinforcer. You are not here to perfect yourself. He says, I am the purifier. But we have to decide which way we're going to walk with this. They walk in opposite directions. Let's say east is just an example east is towards the truth and all that we are west is away from that and all that we're not and if you're standing there going god please tell me about the truth of myself and then you go back over here and you're trying to fix solve change you know make something better in the illusion make a prettier illusion a good illusion to replace the bad illusion and he's like well i would like to show you something over here and you're like i'll be right with you i've got a i've got things to do over here you can do it and he knows that it's hard and he knows you're preoccupied with illusions and he says this you need me <laughs> you need me and we do so he's not going to wait until you have a perfect mind to show you your way back to what is true but he has to wait until that's all you want because if you want your illusions a little bit five percent say you you want to walk east. You like how that sounds. It's a really good idea. But 5% of you wants to walk west. You're not leaving. Do you see? So it's not about leaving this world. 
It's all about consciousness. But be clear that he is waiting for you to want only what God gave you. But it is everything, by the way. And you will love it. And you will be glad you have it. And you will not want anything else. He says, when you remember what you forgot, you would laugh at the idea of giving it away. You would laugh at yourself for ever thinking it should be something other than what it is. I mean, if he's given you everything eternally forever, what else is there? He says, why wait for heaven? It is yours today. He gave it to you a long time ago, but we have to claim it. And how do we claim it? We claim it by choosing to remember our true identity and only that. We are not a body. That's the tricky part. When you're looking at someone else that's causing you a problem, he's not asking you to get their body to morph into this angel person. Try to imagine that what you're seeing in their body is like your dream at night. They're kind of a figure in your dream just while you're praying and thinking about this. They're a figure in your dream. That's not the truth of them. And what you're looking at doesn't look anything like what they really look like. I want you to imagine that the person you're looking at that's bothering you right now, the truth of them, let's say, is over there behind you and you don't even know where it is. It's just back there somewhere. And it's not this. It's not what you're looking at. And if you will learn to refuse just in your mind what you're looking at as their identity, you are opening a place in your mind for God to show you who they are. And the bonus is that you get to remember who you are. So try not to get somebody to morph into a nice person. That's not the idea. That's trying to make a bad illusion into a good illusion. I want you to look at what you're looking at. If you see someone homeless on the street, struggling, sad, and you might be called to help them, and that's beautiful. That's love and action, even in the dream. But before you leave that moment, take a moment and remind yourself that this figure in your dream that looks so sad and broken and depleted, remind yourself God did not create that condition stand up to it. If you have to sit in your car, hold on to your steering wheel and say, God, you did not create homelessness. It is not your will. It is not my will. I wholly bless my brother. I extend to them all that they are, all that they ever were, all that you created within them. And I refuse this image in terms of deciding against them. I will not decide against my brother today. What you created is all I want to know and remember. And if you're telling me I am projecting this in the place of that, I forgive myself. I have no use for that. I choose only to see them as you see them. And I may not even know what it is, but I know it's not that. And then, of course, if you're guided to help them, God will use you in the dream. You might be the very one that's helping them have a home or transportation or 20 bucks or 100 bucks. Like you might be that person. In the dream, he will peace with everyone. You might be that person that represents God to them today in the dream. But don't forget who they are. Let's no longer have an identity crisis. Let's take a moment. There's a miracle story I'd like to share. It's called the faith of a four-year-old. And, you know, even at four years old, sometimes, you know, out of the mouths of babes, right? There was a time when my brother, who I talked to this morning, and now he's, I don't know what, how old are you, brother? You're, I guess you're. 10 years older than me, 72. So this is when he was four years old, way back then. So at four years old, my brother asked my mother for a bird. And she said, no, no, you know, you're, you're not old enough to take care of a bird yet. And, you know, my mom had lots to do herself. So, and a little brother at home. And she said, no, no, you know, not time for a bird. And my brother said, but I want a bird. I want a bird. And she said, no, no, it's not a time for a bird. You can't have a bird. And my four-year-old brother at the time, he said, um, well, I'm going to pray for a bird. I'm going to ask God for a bird, and I know he'll give it to me. And my mother, as she shared with me later, feeling a little uh, uh, sad about her response, but what she said to him in the moment was, you can ask God for a bird all you want, but he's not going to give you a bird. 
Hmm, we'll see about that, right? So the four-year-old, he says, well, I'm going to go pray. And she said, well, you can pray. So he goes out on the porch. Now look at the wisdom of this four-year-old. He puts himself in the line of receivership. You know, in his mind, it made sense. Birds are outside, going outside. Miracles are practical. You know, if you're looking for a love relationship or a love partner, you're probably not going to lock yourself in the bathroom. That's probably not where it's going to happen. Now, you don't have to figure out where to be, but you probably want to put yourself in receivership somewhere. Where would that be? Ask God. He will tell you. So my brother goes out on the porch and he prays and a bird lands on his shoulder. And he went in the house and he said right then, and I learned this this morning, the bird actually flew away for a moment. And he walked in the house and he told my mother, well, a bird landed on my shoulder. And she said, oh, okay. And, and I think probably in that moment, she probably thought he was having a big imagination. And he went back outside and the bird came back and the bird landed on his shoulder again. And he said he played with a few of the kids and the bird stayed right on his shoulder. And ultimately he showed my mother the bird. And I'm sure she was without words. And I guess she felt, yes, we should probably keep that bird. <laughs> so she got the bird a little cage and they did keep the bird. And when my brother would play in the yard with the other kids, the bird would continue to just sit on his shoulder amazing and i think about that story about that bird and you go well why did he get what he asked for there's probably a lot of you right now that are asking for something from god and it just feels like he's not giving it to you he's not answering let's look at this more deeply the four-year-old knew that god loved him even at four and if you're not so sure, let's start leaning in that direction. Let's start leaning in the direction that maybe God does love me. Maybe he is trying to help me. Maybe he is answering me. I'm willing to lean in that direction. So the four-year-old, for some reason, he knew that. He knew that he could pray and he knew he could ask for something and he knew that he would get it. Did you hear his words? I'm going to pray and I know God will give this to me. If you're not so sure in your case, maybe you could just borrow his certainty. Say, God, I'm not so sure you're there that you'll answer me because it feels like you haven't been. But I'm going to borrow the certainty of that four-year-old and I'm just going to go with it. Borrow his certainty. We are one and we can. Another one of our wonderful gifts. And I also think that the four-year-old didn't have any stories against having this bird, having his answer. He didn't have any stories like, well, I'd really like to have this bird, but it'll probably just die because that's what birds do. Or I'd really like to have this bird, but I'm not sure I would have enough food to feed it. Or maybe I'm not old enough to take care of it. Maybe my mom's right. You know, he didn't have all these anti-thoughts like, well, I really want this from God, but here's... 42 reasons why I shouldn't have it and why it doesn't make sense and why I haven't received it already. Just God, thank you for a bird. I receive it. And just knowing that God loves you and the answer is yes. What if we had no other interference with our thoughts? And I feel like that's what happened there. And we are that four-year-old child. We have a right to ask. We are entitled to miracles. In A Course in Miracles, that's what he says. We are entitled to miracles. And he says, when you ask for a miracle, whatever it is, just thank him for it. He says, there's two things you need to do. You can have anything you ask for. Two things you need to do. One, feel it as if it's done. And two, make no decision yourself about how it will come. And that's probably simplifying it. But of course, make no decision against having what you would ask for. Have no decisions about 
how it should come, why it should come, why it didn't come, how come it didn't come already. Try to quiet your mind. Be the four-year-old. Be in your excitement. Thank God in advance. Expect it. Know that he gave you everything. And even in the dream, you know, it's not about stuff or materiality. It's just that if God created us, which he did, and he gave us everything, which he did, and now we fall asleep and we're in this dream, your dream and mine should reflect we have it all. It should. Because if we're asleep in the dream and we know to our core who we are and what we represent, and we fell asleep to that for a little bit without any big opinions around it, our dream is going to reflect this. And that's what is called the happy dream. The happy dream is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing to fear. So let's borrow his certainty today. In your notes, I wrote, you must reclaim your true identity in order to claim your divine inheritance. And remember, your divine inheritance comes with everything, everything. And I feel in my life that I am so close to everything. And it may not be completely known in my mind, but it is known more than I have ever known in my life. And I am so happy and blessed, deeply, deeply blessed. And I'm aware of it. And I feel God closer than my breathing. When I am worried or frustrated about something, I know what to do. I know where to go. I know who to ask. It's not about me having all the answers anymore. It's about going to the answerer and just humbly allowing him to guide me back out of my own illusions. In lesson 191, perhaps you'd just like to close your eyes and hear what it says. Here's a few paragraphs. It is called, I am the Holy Son of God himself. Here is your declaration of release from bondage of the world. And here as well is all the world released. You do not see what you have done by giving to the world the role of jailer to the Son of God. What could it be but vicious and afraid, fearful of shadows, punitive and wild, lacking all reason, blind? insane with hate. What have you done that this should be your world? What have you done that this is what you see? Deny your own identity, and this is what remains. You look on chaos and proclaim it as yourself. There is no sight that fails to witness this to you. There is no sound that does not speak of frailty within you and without. No breath you draw that does not seem to bring you nearer death. No hope you hold but will dissolve in tears. Deny your own identity and you will not escape the madness which induced this weird, unnatural, and ghostly thought that mocks creation and that laughs at God. Deny your own identity, and you assail the universe alone, without a friend, a tiny particle of dust against the legions of your enemies. Deny your own identity, and look on evil, sin, and death, and watch despair snatch from your fingers every scrap of hope leaving you nothing but the wish to die. Yet what is it except a game you play in which identity can be denied? You are as God created you. All else but this one thing is folly to believe. In this one thought is everyone set free. In this one thought are all illusions gone. In this one fact is sinlessness proclaimed to be forever part of everything 
the central core of its existence and its guarantee of immortality. Let today's idea find a place among your thoughts and you have risen far above the world and all the worldly thoughts that hold you prisoner. And from this place of safety and escape, you will return and set it free. For he who can accept his true identity is truly saved. And his salvation is the gift he gives to everyone in gratitude to God, who pointed out the way to happiness that changed his whole perspective of the world. One holy thought like this, and you are free. You are the holy son of God himself. And with this holy thought, you learn as well that you have freed the world. Be glad today. How very easily is hell undone. You need but tell yourself, I am the Holy Son of God himself. I cannot suffer. I cannot be in pain. I cannot suffer loss. Nor fail to do all that salvation asks. Breathe it in. And I know it looks like you can suffer. It looks like you can be in pain because you have invented a false you. Not to dismiss the pain you feel, but to show you your way out of it. We must claim our true identity. God did not create pain. God did not create loss. God did not create suffering. These are concepts our mind has given a home. Let's make those concepts homeless. He says in that one thought is everything you look on wholly changed. You who perceive yourself as weak and frail with futile hopes and devastated dreams born but to die, to weep and suffer pain. Hear this. All power is given unto you in earth and heaven. There is nothing that you cannot do. Breathe it in. Accept. Recognize. Be excited. Celebrate. There is nothing you cannot do. The limits that you thought you had are not true. They are not real and they have no effects on you. You play the game of death, of being helpless, pitifully tied to dissolution in a world which shows no mercy to you. Yet when you accord it mercy, will its mercy shine on you? Let the Son of God awaken from his sleep and opening his holy eyes, return again to bless the world he made. In error, it began, but it will end in the reflection of his holiness and he will sleep no more and dream of death. Join with me today. Your glory is the light that saves the world do not withhold salvation longer. Look about the world and see the suffering there. Is not your heart willing to bring your weary brothers rest? Your brothers must await your own release. They stay in chains until you are free. They cannot see the mercy of the world until you find it in yourself. They suffer pain until you have denied its hold on you. They die until you accept your own eternal life. 
You are the Holy Son of God himself. Remember this, and all the world is free. Remember this, and earth and heaven are one. Accepting the atonement for yourself means not to give support to someone's dream of sickness and of death. It means that you share not his wish to separate and let him turn illusions on himself, nor do you wish that they be turned instead on you. Thus, illusions have no effects, and you are free of dreams of pain because you let him be. Unless you help him, you will suffer pain with him because that is your wish, and you become a figure in his dream of pain as he is in yours. So do you and your brother both become illusions and without identity. There is a way of finding certainty right here and now. Refuse to be a part of fearful dreams, whatever form they take, for you will lose identity in them. You find yourself by not accepting them as causing you and giving you effects. You stand apart from them, but not apart from him who dreams them. Thus you separate the dreamer from the dream and you join in one, but let the other go. That means when you're facing someone or working with someone that is sick, sad, broken, difficult, reflecting something that is disturbing your peace. Join with their mind, not their dream of pain. Join with the truth of them, not their dream of sorrow. That, that's all he's asking you to do. Don't join with their dream. Join with the dreamer. The dream is but illusion in the mind. And with the mind, you would unite, but never with the dream. It is the dream you fear, not the mind. You see them as the same because you think that you are but a dream. And what is real and what is but illusion in yourself, you do not know and cannot tell apart. Like you, your brother thinks he is a dream. Share not in his illusion of himself, for your identity depends on his reality. Think rather of him as a mind in which illusions still persist, but as a mind which brother is to you. It is his reality that is your brother, as is yours to him. Your mind and his are joined in brotherhood. His body and his dreams but seem to make a little gap where yours have joined with his. So all we have to do is focus on joining with the mind of those around us. Don't worry about the body or the story or what they're doing or not doing. Join with who they are in consciousness. Let's pause and take a deep, relaxing breath. You know, it might seem hard to get to this place of knowing your true identity and standing on that and trying to not waffle or go back into illusions. Just keep in mind, you have a perfect guide. Perfect. And this guide's function is to show you the way. This guide's function guarantees your success. This guide kicks into high gear when you are ready to remember who you are and you have no other wish. There's nothing else you'd rather be. And then your guide will finish it and will show you your way back and will also show you what to say, what to do, how to conduct yourself, even in the dream. Let's draw in another deep, relaxing breath. We're going to do a little guided meditation. And today we are simply claiming our true identity. 
we wandered away from that in our mind for a while, caused quite a stir. <laughs> Let's just forgive ourselves, call it a day or a millennium, or whatever it's been. And let's say, okay, enough of that, enough fooling around in what is not so. And let's get back to what is true. And I think you will find you'll be glad you did. So let's take some time here today. I want you to imagine in front of you yourself as a body, all the things you're going through, it's almost like you're spinning those plates, you know, you're trying to keep them from crashing to the ground or getting worse or having nothing at all. There you are working one plate, the other, the other, they're spending, 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 trying so hard to not let things get worse. First, I'd just like you to send love to yourself. It is truly an impossible task, isn't it? Don't be upset with yourself. Don't judge yourself. We've had enough judgment, haven't we? We've suffered long enough. So we're not here to flog ourselves. We are here to find our way out of the mess. And we have a perfect guide. And he's telling us if we will claim our true identity and that of everyone around us, and we refuse to judge against them, like, oh, no, no, I am going to protect this person from my judgments against them. I am going to hold in my mind their true identity, no matter what they say, what they do, how ridiculous they are in the dream. I will not play the game, ego. What is it for? To try to convince you that you are not what you are. That's the name of the game, right? Let's convince you that you are not what you are. And we'll do it either with you through your body that you have made, or we will do it through the other bodies that you have made in them. And there's so many options. Remember the rules of the game. You know, when you buy a new little game, a board game, and you kind of go through the instructions, you're like, okay, how does this game work? We have the instructions. This is how the game works. Your ego puts something in front of you that looks imperfect looks finite, doesn't look like love, is changeable, and it tries to get you to engage, reinforce, validate, try to fix it, solve it, make it different than it is, and the ego wins that round. Don't play the game. It's hard because people say what they do and do what they do, and our temptation to judge them is... <laughs> way up there don't forget what the object of the game is and refuse to play it just think no matter what somebody does how dark they look how evil they seem to be i am not going to decide against their true identity because they are simply playing out a role in my dream that i have given to them by accepting that we could be something other than we are i forgive myself and i forgive them for playing that role enough already. I am going to seek only their true identity. I am going to choose only to acknowledge, recognize, and declare who they really are. Now, we don't have to be so tough. We just have to be consistent. Because remember, if you're 5% a little bit involved and attached to your illusions and getting those fixed in the way you'd like them to be, you'd really like a really good illusion to replace your really bad illusion. The Holy Spirit has to wait until you are done with illusions. You won't lose anything. Everything you value, everything that represents love and joy in your life, that's yours forever. All you will lose is what you never wanted in the first place. You cannot lose by remembering your true self. You cannot lose by claiming your divine inheritance. You cannot lose by accepting what God already gave you in place of what you made for yourself. Your ego will tell you you will lose or it will get worse. It's a liar. <laughs> That's its game. And like, if you won't play the game, it's like, you're going to have nothing. It's going to get worse. You're going to lose. <laughs> I call it a tape in the corner. 
imagine every day you're listening to that tape in the corner and the tape in the corner is saying, you're not safe. You're not loved. You're going to lose. You're going to be homeless. You're not going to have anything. You're getting old. Look at you. You're getting worse. You'll have nothing. <laughs> and, and then let's say you're listening and you're listening and you're trying to stop all that from happening. You're trying to keep it from going. And then one day you walk in and in a quiet moment, you look over and you're like, that's a tape. <laughs> that's a tape I've been listening to. I mean, it's not like a real thing. It's just a tape. It is a tape in the corner of our mind. And it plays all day long. That's okay. We don't have to listen. You'll get better at that. Pretty soon you won't hear it at all. Still playing while we're in the body. It's still trying to get our attention. The game goes on. But if you won't play the game, you know, if everyone in the family sits down and plays a board game and you opt out, I mean, you're not in that game. <laughs> so it's okay. And then your choice to not play that game encourages others to not play it either. Because with the ego, there's always a loser. With God, there is no loss. There is no loser. Let's take a few minutes. These are quotes out of A Course in Miracles, some of the most beautiful lessons I love taking some of the words in A Course in Miracles and putting them into I statements or first person statements. Made a few little modifications just to make it roll for a meditation. But if one of those uh, really strikes you, I did put what I did in your notes. You can go back to the lesson and read it in its purest state. But I think this makes it a little easier for you to hear in meditation so that it feels more personal for you. This guided meditation is called, I am as God created me. Take a nice, deep, relaxing breath, being very clear, conscious, and aware. We don't want to go to sleep right now. We are ready to remember who we are together. Take a moment to bring what you think of as yourself to your mind and the details surrounding the body you believe you are, the people in your life, the challenges that you have had or still have, your concerns about the future. It's probably quite a story, very deep, complicated, so many moving parts. And doesn't it make sense that we would get preoccupied with that story? So let's just have some love for ourselves that, yes, we've been preoccupied. Who wouldn't be? But God is calling us to remember who we are so that all of the pain, lack, and suffering can stop. He says this. We can say a prayer that goes something like this. Father, I made an image of myself, and it is this I have been calling the Son of God. Yet is creation as it always was. For your creation is unchangeable. I am your most holy precious child, the one my father loves. My holiness remains the light of heaven. My true identity is that I am your son, and you created everything that is. My true identity abides in you. You are my goal my father. What but you could I desire to have? What way but that which leads to you could I desire to walk? And what except the memory of you could signify to me the end of dreams and substitutions for the truth? You are my only goal. I am 
as you created me. There is nothing else I'd rather be. Heavenly Father, I did not make myself, although in my insanity I thought I did. Yet I have not left my source, remaining part of who created me. My Father, I am your holy child. I call on you today. Let me remember you created me. Let me remember my true identity. Let me recognize my sinlessness again. Let me see myself as Christ sees me. Let me see beyond the illusions of my brothers and into their holiness. Take a moment and do that. Imagine the light of holiness in everyone. And that includes the murderers, the molesters, the rapists, the people doing terrible, horrible things. Take a moment in your mind's eye. Extend the light within you to them. Refuse those images in your mind. They are not what God created them to be. I am more holy than all the thoughts of holiness of which I now conceive. My shimmering and perfect purity is far more brilliant than is any light that I have ever looked upon. My love is limitless, with an intensity that holds all things within it, in the calm of quiet certainty. My strength comes not from burning impulses which move the world, but from the boundless love of God himself. Heavenly Father, you know my true identity. Reveal it now to me, who am your son, that I may waken to the truth in you and know that heaven is restored to me. Heavenly Father, I will not hurt myself again today. Let me accept forgiveness as my only function. I will no longer attack my mind and give it images of pain. I will no longer teach myself or anyone else that we are powerless. When you have given us your power and your love, I will seek only to accept what is already mine. I will choose today to accept my true identity and escape forever from all things the dream of fear appeared to offer me. Father, I am your son. And you have taught me that I cannot be hurt. And if I think I can be hurt or suffer or be lacking, it is because I have forgotten my one and true identity, which I share with you and everyone else. Today I claim my true identity as the holy child of God. I am forever free from all of my mistakes. I am saved from what I thought I was. Heavenly Father, we seek your holy world today, for we 
your loving children have lost our way a while. But we have listened to your voice today and learned exactly what to do to be restored to heaven and for our true identity to be remembered and experienced. We have learned that we must claim our true identity and wish for nothing else. There is nothing else we'd rather be. We must be determined to see this same power and love and innocence in everyone else, regardless of what our eyes are seeing or what our ears are hearing. We give thanks today. The world endures but for an instant. For today, we go beyond that tiny instant to eternity. Heavenly Father, I will not fear to look within myself today. Within me is eternal innocence because it is your will that it be there forever and forever. I am your holy, precious child, the one you love, the one that you gave everything, and this cannot be changed. I was afraid to look within myself because I thought what I had made of myself was me. I made another will that is not true. And I thought that what I created was real. Yet I have learned that what I made in error has no effects. Within me is your holiness. Within me is the memory of your love forever. Today I am taking a step towards my certain release from the dream I made and the consequences I thought were real. The altar you created within me and for me stands serene and undefiled. It is the holy altar to my true self and there I find my true identity. I am learning that forgiveness looks only on sinlessness alone, and it judges not. Every time I forgive myself or someone else, I come closer to you and the memory of our oneness forever. I am redeemed every time I elect to follow in this way. I have within me both the memory of you and one who leads me to it. Heavenly Father, I will hear your voice and find your peace today. For I would love my own identity and find in it the memory of you. Thank you for teaching me that your love, which created me, is what I am. Today I seek my own identity. And I will find it in these words. Love, which created me, is what I am. Now I seek no more, for love has prevailed. You have waited for my coming home. You have waited for me to no longer turn away from the holy face of Christ. You have kept the truth of my identity safe for me 
all of this time. Father, I thank you for what I am, for keeping my identity untouched, safe, and sinless. In the midst of all the thoughts my foolish mind made up, thank you for saving me from them. Heavenly Father, you are my refuge and security. I will not look for my security in illusions, nor attempt to find my peace in another person or circumstance. In you, I find my refuge and my strength. In you is my identity. In you is everlasting peace, and it is only there that I will remember who I really am. Heavenly Father, I come home to you today. I choose to be as you created me and find the holy precious child you created within me to be myself. Heavenly Father, I am willing to see every other person as sinless. You have taught me that peace will come to me when I ask with real desire and sincerity of purpose and when I share it with the Holy Spirit. I am willing to think of the one person I have been judging very harshly. And I am determined to see this person as you created them. Perfect love. Sinless. Innocent. Capable, a perfect blessing in my life. Thank you, God, for the vision to see them as you see them, that I may love them as you love them. I want to see. I am determined to see. I will place no value on their body, their personality, or their appearance. I will hold onto no illusions of what I thought they were. I desire to see them only as you created them to be. I will shower them off in my mind and release them from all of my judgments against them, that I may be free along with them. Behold the Holy Son of God, exactly as you created them, and exactly as you and I would have them be. Heavenly Father, thank you for teaching me that all I have to do is train my mind to overlook my projections and illusions in the world around me. And to remember that my only goal is to remember the truth of who we are. This memory is hidden in my mind, hidden only by my wish to focus on something else. Dear God, you are my only goal and my only love. I have no aim but to remember you. My goal is but to follow in the way that leads to you.
I have no goal but this. What could I want but to remember you? What could I seek that would be more valuable than my own true identity? My true identity is so secure, so lofty, sinless, glorious, and great, and so wholly free from guilt that heaven looks to it to give it light. My true identity lights the world as well. My true identity is the gift you gave to me the one as well I give the world. There is no gift but this that can be either given or received. This is reality and only this. Claiming my true identity is where illusions end because it is the truth. Heavenly Father, my name is still known to you. I forgot it for a while and did not know where I was going, who I was, or what it is I was to do. Thank you for reminding me, for I am weary of the world I see. Thank you for revealing what you would have me see instead. Heavenly Father, today I give thanks for my identity in you. My home is safe. Protection is guaranteed in all I do. Power and strength is available to me in all my undertakings. I can fail in nothing. Everything I touch takes on a shining light that blesses and that heals. I am one with you and with the universe. And I rejoice as I remember that you go with me wherever I go. Thank you for reminding me that no miracle can ever be denied to those who know that they are one with you. Today I join in this awareness of my true identity as I proclaim I am one with God. For in these words, I also say that I am saved and healed, and that I can save and heal accordingly. Today I have accepted who I truly am, and we now would give this blessing to everyone I see that they would be healed along with me. Today, I will trust your voice to speak to me as you see fit. Certain, you will not fail. Today, I declare with my whole heart I am, as God created me, one with him, one with my brothers and sisters, one with my true self. I am not a body. I am eternal spirit, invulnerable, all-powerful, safe, healed, and blessed. Today is my day of freedom and release by the power and authority of God himself. 
I am entitled to miracles. I am blessed with everlasting love, happiness, health, abundance, and peace. I am as God created me now and forever. There is nothing else and no place I'd rather be. Only the truth is true. Heavenly Father, may your will be done through me forever and ever. Amen. Let's take a moment to bring your awareness back into the room. Today, we simply acknowledge our true identity. Don't let your ego convince you otherwise about yourself or about anyone else. And even if you're experiencing pain, discomfort, lack, loneliness, despair, pause right there. Say to yourself, I know this is my ego trying to convince me that I am a body, I am separated, I am vulnerable, I am powerless, that God has left the building, right? And instead, say to yourself, I will not use what I see or what I hear or what I'm feeling to deny my true identity. I am the holy child of God himself. And there is nothing of this world that can change that. And when you do this, it's important that you acknowledge what you're going through just for yourself. You're not here to deny what you're going through. But it's important to understand that you are not your body. You are not what you are feeling or hearing or seeing any more than you are that in your dream at night. You are as God created you. Be excited. Watch what happens. Let the Holy Spirit show you the rest. He says God takes the final step. Won't it be fun to see what that looks like? I thank you all today with my whole heart for doing this with me with great love for a willingness to take a stand today for that which we are. And we're not going to let it go. And no matter what the ego is saying or trying, attempting, the ego is a liar. It offers nothing we want, nothing we would keep. So thank you, dear God, as you bless each one here. I'm so excited for those that stayed in that meditation and were willing to listen and offer you their full attention and choose again who they really are so that they can blow those doors open in their mind to their own divine inheritance and all that you have given them already, that they would know what that is with certainty and excitement that their heart would be so fulfilled that they would never again question your love and all that you have given. We thank you, God, that your will is done. We have no decisions against it. And your will is our will. And you have taught us that our will is your will. We are one. And there's no place we'd rather be. Amen. All right, everyone. Well, let's uh, meet up in the Miracle Cafe. But I want you to just open your mind to a new perception that was really big, what we just did. So open your mind to a new perception. You are claiming your true self. That's what he's asking you to do. You're claiming that in everyone else. 
That's what he's asking you to do. You are refusing to decide against anyone and their glory and their magnificence and their perfection as God gave it to them. They are not their bodies. They are not their personalities. They are not their behaviors or their appearance. They are as God created them. And you, with your willingness, are saying yes to that today. Watch what happens. The Holy Spirit can now fulfill his function, the one God gave him the moment we got lost. Let's see what happens. Remember to expect miracles. You are entitled to them. Never forget who you are. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back from the break. This is the Miracle Cafe where we meet after the service. If you have any questions or prayer requests, anything you would like to discuss that has to do with A Course in Miracles or spiritual questions, happy to help you out. So thank you today for being with me and reclaiming that true identity. It matters more than you can possibly realize. It's a really big deal. So I am uh, doing, you know, Robin, first of all, you know, I absolutely adore you. I love you. And I am um, doing the um, uh, Ego's Playbook. Go ahead. I'm getting so much out of it. And I so really appreciate it. You're a genius. You really, truly are. Thank you. Um, when it comes to, you know, like I ha still have so many physical things going on. And they're really painful. The difference is, is like now I'm back in life before I was like totally given up. I had been in bed and it was like, you know, it was too much. The The physical pain was just a lot. Mm -hmm. um, how is it possible to actually change things that are, um, uh, how do you call them? Um, structural. Can you give me an example? Okay. This is probably too much information for everybody, but one of the That's things right. that <laughs> that one, of, one of the things that the doctors told me is I have urine retention and that that could be causing tons of pain because the urine just stays in there. And, you know, I know I had a distended bladder, so I'm working on stuff, but that sounds structural. Um, is it, it, do you think that, that the Holy spirit can still help with that kind of stuff? That's like structural or I believe a hundred percent. Yes. I know it, a structural is an interesting word, but I mean, where I've, I've just seen spontaneous healing. I've heard about it so many times where, I mean, Jesus raised people from the dead. So that's, that's kind of the, you know, that's a long range there to bring somebody back from the dead. So I know he can handle your, your uh, situation there. You know, there's a part in A Course in Miracles that says basically that there's a correction in heaven for everything that we have imagined here. I think the biggest thing, Deborah, is for you to not decide against your own healing, because you can look at the problem and you can think this problem is too far gone or it's too complicated or it's insolvable. And that's what has to stop. Okay. The power of God is the only power there is. And you're not healing a real problem. It's the undoing of a false idea. Realize how simple that is in truth, because if you overcomplicate it in your mind, he can't take it from you. You have to understand that in your mind, you just kind of walk yourself through it. Okay. In my mind, I decided somewhere along the way that I am this body that could have this problem that could be in this pain that could have these effects. And I was mistaken. That's not even possible. But because I'm the holy child of God, I can actually believe that I could be something else and then experience it as if I am. That's all that happened. And so I'm not going to give like an, a degree of difficulty to the problem. I'm just going to know that in my mind, it became a big problem, but in truth for God, it's not a problem because in truth, it's not real. And that's not to dismiss the pain and the suffering, but the more you understand, you might say to yourself, I am experiencing 
this problem and it's a projection of my mind. It's like, you kind of have to tell yourself that. So you remind yourself, I'm not looking at something real. I am looking at something that I am projecting. That's not true. It's not real. My ego wants me to believe it, but my ego is a liar. And what I'm looking at has no effects. I am actually looking at something that is not there. I want you to start taking your power back from the problem as you see it and reclaim it within you. And I know it sounds odd to say I'm looking at something that is not there. I want you to imagine you're going to sleep tonight and you have a dream that you've got this retention issue, right? You have a dream and in your dream, it's worse. And he added in this and he added in that. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I had those problems. Now you got five more problems on top of that. And then tomorrow morning, let's say you wake up and you realize, oh, that was a dream. I was actually entertaining an idea in my mind that didn't actually happen. Sure looked real, sure felt real but thank God it wasn't. And what I want you to do is realize that we're still dreaming and we're going to borrow on that understanding that we're going to actually wake up a little more. And we are going to realize that your situation that you have right now gone, you won't even remember it at some point. It won't even be relevant to you. It's only relevant while you are, while your ego it's trying to get you to use it to identify yourself as not what God created. And when you will not use it for that, when you're committed to not using it to decide against your true identity, the Holy Spirit's function is to clean it up, heal the part of your mind that's producing it and clean up the mess. That's his function, but it cannot be fully realized in that function until we're no longer using that idea to decide against our true identity. And yes, a hundred percent. Yes. I believe miracles are possible in every possible way. I mean, because it's an illusion, you know, if you have a dream tonight, you could have a dream Martians landed. You could have a dream that you picked up 10 cars and threw them across the street. You could, it's a dream and, and dreams are not logical to begin with, but the best thing going for an illusion or a dream is that it can change and that anything is possible, right? So let's borrow that. Let's say, okay, well, in the dream, it's a dream it's made up. So why don't I make up my own healing? Let's say you've got some weights in your hand and, you know, and you've got a little, tray with two dishes on each side, a little balance. And one says illusion and one says the truth. And, and the ego says, Oh, this problem, it's a 10 pounder. You're like, Oh, you're right. Boom. There it goes. And the truth goes, you know? <laughs> and then the ego says, Oh, this problem. You can't do anything with that. You can't get out of this. You take another weight, you go, boom, and you put it on the illusion. And that truth goes, Whoop. now it's like, you almost don't even know where it is. I need you to take all the weight and put it on the truth. And we need to make that illusion arm with blow it away with a feather. He said, it's a feather through a cloud, but we're the holy child of God. And we have decided it is so much more. And because we've decided he cannot overrule us. He cannot decide against us. All he can do is call to us <laughs> and say, please choose again. You want to be free. I'm telling you how to be free, but, but we believe it's real because it just looks real and it feels real. But keep in mind, you can create that same scenario tonight when you sleep. Can't you, you can have a dream that this is even worse, you know, like you can have a dream. Well, you totally make me believe in miracles. You know, uh, I wish I could do it faster. <laughs> well, just remember, it can be instant when you are no longer invested on any level. So we practice not being invested because we're used to being invested. <laughs> and so we have to remind ourselves, you know, just imagine your whole life, you slept on the right hand side of the bed and now you've decided because every morning you get up, you stub your toe and you're like, well, I like the right side, but you've decided I don't want to sleep on the right side anymore. I want to sleep on the left side because I won't get up and stub my toe. Do you realize that for several days in a row, you're probably going to have to remind yourself when you wake up, I'm going to get up on the left side of the bed. <laughs> I mean, think how something so simple, it takes thinking about it differently. 
It takes a commitment to think about it differently, but that's all. It's not that it's hard. It's that we are deciding against our own decision against ourselves. And once we are committed to no longer denying our true self, no matter what the ego is throwing our way. And it's, if you feel pain, that's okay, but do not use that pain to decide against your true self. You know, if you're feeling sleepy or you can't get sleep, do not use your insomnia to decide against your true self. So even if you're laying there and you cannot sleep at all, and you're like, gosh, I wish I could sleep, then say, God, truly, I wish I could sleep, but I'm not seeking illusions and whether I can sleep or not sleep, you decide about that. You decide about my illusions. And I will not use this insomnia to convince myself that I am not entitled to peace or well-being or rest. And so God, you decide about my sleep. That's your department. What I am going to do is remember that I am entitled to happiness, peace, joy, celebration. You gave me everything. That's who I am. I will not let it go. I will not use this condition or what I feel or what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing. I will not use my eyes or my senses or my feelings to decide against my true identity. And the Holy Spirit says, Deborah, thank you so much. Now I can get involved. God sent me, I'm here. And now I can clean this mess up for you because you're no longer <laughs> interested in your ego showing you that you are something else. So the Holy Spirit can dive right in once we have that open mind ready to agree with who we are, ready to no longer decide against who we are. We use our body pain to say, well, there must be a body. We use our face and to say, well, I must be aging. We use our hair of falling out to say, well, you know, we probably have toxins in our food and now we're vulnerable and powerless. And, you know, the ego is relentless. <laughs> he says, you know, beware of the divisiveness of the ego. It's as clever as you are. Do not underestimate the divisiveness of your ego. It knows what bothers you. It knows what frustrates you. It knows what upset you before. And when you start really standing on this true identity, it loves to bring something back that worked before. Cause that's like a, that's like a slam dunk, right? It's like, if it got you to be upset, you know, twice before, even if it was 20 years ago, it it'll bring it back. And that's why I call it junk in your trunk. And that's not in no way to dismiss what you're going through. There's nothing like pain to convince you that you are a body and that you are vulnerable and you are powerless. And the only reason I teach this is because I want the nonsense to stop. I want you out of pain. I want you feeling your true self again. So this is how we get there. Like it sounds odd to say, okay, I'm feeling this pain, but I will not use this pain against my true identity. My ego wants me to use the pain to say, I am not the holy child of God. I am not perfect. I am not whole. I am not what God created. If God didn't create pain and I have pain, what does that say about me? It's trying to convince me, well, God didn't create pain. Okay, that's fine. Then you must be like something else, something you didn't create because you have pain. So it's trying to single me out and make me what I am not. So experience your experience. Try not to judge it and say to yourself, I will not use this experience, this person to decide against my true identity or theirs. I am not a body. God did not create this pain. God did not create this lack. Whatever I am seeing, it's just a made up idea. My ego is a liar. It has no effects of its own. And I will not assign effects to what has no effects. Holy Spirit, I'm out. You step in, you decide on all this for me. My part is to stand on who I am, who everybody else is, and not decide against us. One goal. But your ego is going to knock on the door in, you know, a thousand different ways and say, what about this? What about this? What about this? Now, when you will not engage, it does stop. You will feel the consolidation of your decisions. It gets easier, truly. You know, and whether it's a, a hurricane, you know, maybe you're going on vacation and, you know, this happens for a while where 
you know, say I was practicing, you know, a few years ago where I would be practicing, practicing, I will not, you know, God would give me these words of, I will not use what I see or what I hear or what I feel to decide against my true self. And then let's say you're getting ready to go on your first vacation in like 10 years and the weather was great a week ago. And now you look at your phone and it says a hurricane. You're like, <laughs> you know? and it's the same thing. What's it trying to convince you of? It's trying to convince you that your happiness is vulnerable. It's trying to convince you that bad things happen and there's nothing to do about it. You can do about it. It's trying to convince you that you are powerless and at the mercy of the world you see. It's trying to say, you're not the holy child of God. You are whatever your ego says that you are and you are at the mercy. You are the slave of this universe. You are not the master, right? And so I have to look at that and go, hmm, hurricane, huh? Did God create me to have a hurricane in the place of my happy joy? No. Is a hurricane eternal? No. Is a, a hurricane of love? No. Is a hurricane changeless? No. Doesn't qualify for what God created. It's not real. Boom. Mic drop, right? It's not real because God did not create this condition. Now, I don't have to be certain about that because we don't really remember what's real, not real. But the criteria, at least the way I've learned it, the way he's guided me, is at a minimum, whatever you're looking at, in order for it to be real and of God, has to be eternal, has to be perfect, has to be changeless, and it has to be of love. And if it fails any one of those four, and there's so many other descriptors, but if it fails even one of those, you're looking at an illusion. So you can just use that as like a rule of thumb, like pull it out your little piece of paper, like, hmm, I'm looking at this person being very mean and sarcastic to me. Is that of love? No, ah, I'm looking at my own made up picture. Okay, God, this is not the truth. Thank you that what you created within them is perfect love. They can only bless my life. Holy Spirit, you tell me what to say, what to do. You handle this whole conversation that we're having. And my goal is the highest level of peace. Boom, I'm done. And then what happens? That person either stops doing it or they turn around and do something that actually blesses you and it blows your mind. That's even wilder, right? When they show up and instead of just being this darkened force in your life, now they show up as a blessing and it's very likely that you will never experience it again. I mean, the, the rewards, the blessings are so great. I know it sounds like a wild process and it seems like you'll just never be able to pull it off sometimes. But if you realize your only goal is to not use what you see, feel, or experience to validate what never happened. And then the Holy Spirit's like, back up now because I'm in the building, right? And now I get to do what I came to do. The Holy Spirit is the one to accomplish the healing. The Holy Spirit is the one to heal our mind. The Holy Spirit is the one that shows the miracle, that makes the correction. The Holy Spirit is not bound by time. You were saying, I wish it could be more quick, right? More instant. The Holy Spirit is not bound by time. You, me, we are bound by time because our mind says that we are. But if we will back out of the equation and let the ones in that are not bound by time, miracles we will have. It doesn't need to take time where you could wake up and it just could be better for no darn reason. Would that be okay with us? Or do we need to understand it and have every step and nook and cranny about why that, you know, I'm just like, just let it be healed. Let it be undone in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ himself. We let it be undone. Let me cast this illusion into the lake of nothingness from where it came. I don't even like to call it the lake of fire. Some people do, and that's fine. Gives you that visual of it kind of burning up. But I just like to never give my ego even a little bit. There's no lake of fire for you. You just go back into the depth of nothingness from where you came. Get thee behind me. You have no power. And when you assert your power, light and darkness, they don't fight. If you'll notice, like whenever you bring light into the darkness, the darkness, gone. There's no fight. There's no battle. There's no screeching, yelling, just light and darkness, poof, darkness gone. Health and sickness. There's no fight because what God gave you in health, Deborah, is invulnerable. It cannot be taken away. 
There's nothing of this earth that can impose sickness on you without your consent. And the only way you're consenting to it inadvertently is you have accepted a false version of yourself. And that's why today is so important to really stand on your true identity. No more identity crisis. Somebody says, hi, you know, who are you? In your mind before you say, oh, I'm Deborah. You know, before that, you want your mind saying, I'm a holy child of God, free of all limits, safe and healed and blessed and whole, eternal forever, one with God. I am so blessed. It's so great to be me. Hi, my name's Deborah in this illusion. <laughs> right? But we want to get to where our mind goes there first. And that takes some practice. It's like getting up on the other side of the bed, but pretty soon it is your response. And when you're practicing that with other people, you know, instead of that person at the, you know, the bakery that's behind the counter and they're ignoring the customers and they're not being nice and they're being upsetting and you're standing in line and you're like, nope, is this eternal, changeless, perfect or of love? No. So obviously I'm looking at what I have projected <laughs> from my mind and I'm just going to say no to that. God, you decide about the situation. That's your department. My part is who are they? My ego is trying to convince me that they're not the holy child of God. And I'm not going to go with that today. I'm going to go with, yes, they are the holy child of God. I'm going to go with, yes, I am the holy child of God. And this person cannot take my comfort, my happiness, my well-being. This person cannot delay what God has given me, that there's nothing of this earth that I am vulnerable to. And they can only bless my life, no matter how ridiculous I am seeing them right now. That is not the truth of them. That's my made up version. And so when you're just standing there while you're waiting in line anyway, you're just affirming their true identity and yours. We are not a body. We are eternal spirit. Like the real them is somewhere else, but not there. You know, just like, just like, don't try to see them morph into an angel. Just know that what you're looking at is a projection. That's not it. And that you just want to be awake and remember the truth and then watch what happens. You know, if I walk into a bank and I've, I've done this so many times now, when I walk in, usually there's never a line ever, ever. If Terry and I both, like if we walk into a bakery, no line, if we walk into a grocery store, no line. And then, and then this huge group of people will come in behind us. <laughs> We're like, that's so weird. Like we are, well, we really came at the right time, but now all of a sudden we always come at the right time because there's, it's like a red carpet in your life and wherever you go, it's just good, you know, but in the days when I would walk in the bank and I would be on my lunch hour and I'm like, ah, and that, you know, there's 30 people in line and there's no way to get up, make it go faster. And I would just, and I say, I have a transaction. I really feel I need to do. I would stand way back in the line by the door and I would just stand there and I would remind myself that with God, there is no delay. There's nothing in the way. A Course in Miracles teaches me that God takes me where I am and welcomes me. So there could be a very good reason why I am the where I am. I might be standing next to someone that I can help. I might be in a place where I can hold, you know, just a beautiful light for the whole room. I don't know, but wherever I am, God takes me where I am and welcomes me. And I will not let my ego use this situation to convince me that I am stuck or I am at the mercy of the bank or the bank line or that the power is outside of me. And I just have to deal with the scraps and the fragments of what life throws me. And so when I've done that, and each time I've done that, actually, either more tellers come. And they open up like all the windows and everybody goes and all of a sudden I'm just right there at the window or bankers will literally get up out of their desk and come up and pick me. And I'm not special. I'm just the only one declaring the truth, right? They'll pick me and they'll say, or no, they'll say, is there anybody here that just needs to make a deposit or whatever? And that's usually what I need to do. And, and I'll say, oh me. And they say, and nobody else raises their hand and like 30 people and they go, well, come on over here. I'll take care of that for you. And then I'm out in like one minute, you know, go to the DMV and you know, the DMV for a lot of people is a, a really sad place to hang out <laughs> because you feel like it, at least in California, you feel like it's going to just eat up your whole day. It's busy. It's, it's just a headache. Usually that's the way we see it here in California. Like, Oh, I have to go to the DMV. 
And so one of the first times I went to the DMV and I thought, you know, I'm going to practice these principles at the DMV. You know, you can do it anywhere. So before I went, I made my reservation for peace and I was willing to see, you know, God showing me just a wonderful experience, whatever it is, if it takes long, okay. If it's quick, okay. I'm just showing up and being where God would have me be. Just show me what to do. So I had to go get my tags because for a little while, the DMV would send you your license plate and they put your tags under the label on the top of the envelope, like a crazy place. And of course I opened it up, pulled out my new plates, threw the envelope away. And apparently thousands of other people did that too, because it was a real issue for the DMV. So I go get in line. It's a very long line, but the line's moving quick because you go to the, uh, the front desk to check in. And I'm already looking at, I don't know, it looked like 500 people were there and there's people everywhere standing outside and inside and all over. And so I, I go up and I'm looking at the number on the ticker and it's on like, you know, 512 or something. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I just said, God, I'll just be wherever you would have me be. You show me what to do here. I'm just here to serve your will. And, you know, happiness is with me wherever I go. And I go up to the check-in desk where they give you a number. And I had been there about 60 seconds because the line moved really quick to that front desk. And they said, what are you here to do today? And I said, well, I need to get my tags because I accidentally threw them away when I got my license plate. I didn't know they were underneath the label on the front of the envelope. And they said, yeah, I know a lot of people did that. And they said, do you have your registration? I said, yes, I handed it to them. They reached under the desk and they said, here's your tags. I was out in under two minutes. I didn't do a number. I didn't have to go to the desk. I didn't have to go to the counter. Um, another time I go to the DMV, I go, well, okay, I got to do this again, right? Because I want it to be a great time. So then I go get in line and I'm just doing my thing. My goal is peace. Thank you, God, for the most peaceful, happy outcome. Wherever you would have me be, that's where I'll be. Um, just, you know, just looking for a very happy day today that you would show me. So I go and I get in line, I get my number and the number is like, 250 ahead of where I am. And I'm like, okay, so God, maybe you want me to just hang around today, be helpful, whatever. So I go and I take my seat and I just started, you know, going through my phone and settling in. Cause you think you're going to be there about three hours. I mean, the, I was watching the numbers and you know, they go slow. And so I'm sitting there with my number that's 200 above where we are now looking at my phone. And I did my prayers and I'm, I'm fine. I'll be here. That's fine. I already reconciled to that. And the lady next to me gets a phone call and she looks to me and she said, what number are you? And I told her whatever, like two thirty-two. And she's like, well, I'm like 17 or whatever. And she said, do you want my number? She goes, I have to leave right now for an emergency. And I said, yeah. And then I took her number and they said 17 and <laughs> whatever it was. And I just went straight up. And I went to the desk and I'm just like, this is so funny because I just, God, you know, third time I want you to hear like anywhere, right? I go to the DMV the third time and I have this time it's kind of complicated because my son is in Mexico and he needs me to straighten out the title on his sailboat because he's in Mexico. They won't let him do something at the harbor because Whoever he bought the boat from didn't transfer the title. It sounded really complicated to me, but I realized my challenge in my head was it felt complicated, like it was going to take a while, or I had to see like the right person to really explain all this. And, and I was trying to get it right for him. So I thought, you know what? I can't overcomplicate this in my mind. God, there's nothing hard for you. Whatever he needs me to do, I'm sure we can do that. So I'm going to go show up at the DMV and you're going to show me what to do, who to go to, how this needs to happen. My goal is peace. So I go get in line. I get my number. <laughs> Again, it's way out there. And then they said, they said, well, there's no chairs, but you can just find a place to stand and people everywhere. So I, I look around and I ask God, I go, where do you want me to stand? You know, I just thought, you know, I might run into somebody that needs something. I have the time now, I figure. So I, I spot this little place where there's a countertop and I thought, well, I could lean and I could put my handbag up there and my, I could have something to lean on, even though I'm standing, might be a while. So I go over to this, this ledge and I park and I put my things down. 
I'd been there about 60 seconds. <laughs> and apparently one of the workers came back from lunch and it was her desk, but it was dark when I, when I stepped up there and, and the desk ledge is way up high and she's down low. So she comes back and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, is this your desk? I go, I need to step back. And she goes, no, no, it's fine. She goes, I'm not quite ready yet. And she turns on her light and she gets herself all settled in after her break. And then she looks up at me and she said, what are you here for? And I told her this big story and she goes, well, that's, um, she goes, that's what I do. She goes, give me your paperwork. I go, but my number, and she goes, give me your paperwork. She takes it. I am out in five minutes and she knows exactly what needed to be done. She fills out the whole thing. She's like, boom, 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 boom. And and again, I'm, I'm out in like 10 minutes. And that was like such, I thought, I thought was a really big situation. And I know I go on and on about these things, but you guys have to realize, I think one good thing I have going for me is I don't think I overcomplicate the problem in my mind because I have seen enough miracles and you can borrow from me what I've seen. And you can just say, look, I'm going to borrow Robin's certainty that this is not a big deal because with God, it's the correction of an illusion. He says that they're all the same to him. They're illusions that just need to be undone. Don't overcomplicate that. He, he tells us, he cautions us. If you overcomplicate this in your mind, you take it out of my, my function to help you. Because if you decide it's too hard to solve, God's not allowed to override you on that. You just get to be right. That is too hard to solve. He has to wait until you change your mind. So whatever it is that you're facing today, under it, just say for God, it's nothing for God. It's nothing. Try to imagine that, you know, even a terminal illness is not harder for God to solve than finding a pencil on your desk that you laid under some papers, like try to, in your mind, go, it's all the same. And I'm going to let God show me that it's all the same. And I will not decide against him. The minute we decide there is an order of difficulty, then we don't welcome the miracle because in our mind, we've decided our problem is real. It's too hard to solve. There's nothing that can be done. And God goes, okay, well, I'm here when you're ready to see that differently. I know it sounds simpler than it feels like it is, but you're going to see that it leads you to your answers. You have a perfect guide within you. Know that you have a right to miracles. God loves you. He's trying to reach you. He's trying to help you understand that you don't need to suffer. He never created you to suffer. He never required you to suffer. That was actually self-imposed. And it was all by accident. I really believe it's not like we got up one day and then said, oh, let's see what suffering's like. I think we got up one day and said, what if we were something other than this? And there was nothing on the table that we could be. If you are everything and it's good, what you're left with is not a very good alternative. And that's kind of what we experienced. And then we freaked ourselves out because we made it look real. And I think we've just been trying to find our way back ever since. And he said, okay, you're all right. You didn't do anything in truth, but you did decide against the truth. So now I've got to send a teacher of truth and the Holy spirit to help you find your way back because now your mind is filled and flooded with fear. And that fear is making you think that what you did happened and it didn't happen anymore than your dreams at night. I love that we have dreams at night to compare to, because otherwise we would just say, what are you talking about? You know, but because we can have dreams at night and they just seem so real and we don't know they're not real till we wake up. We can imagine that we're still doing that right now. That's just not a stretch for me. I think that makes total sense. And he says, the only reason you don't wake up all the way is because there's some parts of the story that you have made that you're very invested in. You know, maybe it's getting your little doggy well, or maybe it's, you know, hooking up with that person over there, or maybe it's getting that other person to love you the way that you've been wanting to be loved or getting that person to bring home more money so that you feel more safe and more at peace, whatever it is, like we've become invested in this story 
So he says the special relationships that we have formed in our mind are keeping us from the complete awakening, but that awakening will happen under the Holy Spirit's guidance. He's going to show us the whole thing. And the more we welcome that, want that, want only that, the quicker it will be. And it can be instantaneous. Super cool. Hi, Christy. So good to see you, my friend. I haven't seen you in so long. You've probably been out there, but you don't show your face a lot. <laughs> it's so good to see you. You're fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I, like Thank I haven't you. seen you in 10 years. And you look, um, well, it feels that way, doesn't it? it? Time flies and it's like, well, was it 10 years or was it five years? I don't know, but you look you look younger than you did five years ago. You look so fabulous. Good for Special you. Special effects. Thank you. <laughs> the fully perfect eternal child. You know, I was thinking the same thing of you. So we must be in a time warp. I know that's good, right? Well, we are because I'm we're looking eternal. at you and I'm going, I, yeah, you, well, like, who needs to get old, right? <laughs> well, that's what it's feeling like. And I identify with Deborah as far as body, but I'm working on it. I'm working with it. I'm working on it because uh, you got it. Well, you are a masterpiece that has already been completed. And yeah. your only task is to remember that's true <laughs> and that you've never been anything less. And you're just saying, God, help me to understand. I have never been anything other than what you created me to be. And that whole story I've been experiencing as real as it seems to be, it's not. Help me to get that. I want to get that. I seek only what you have given. I want only what you is mine. And he says, you are asking for what is rightfully yours in truth. Nice. I have a question for you. Sure. If I'm okay with that. Yes. It's been a very interesting year. Mother passed in January. I'm good with that. I had closure, completion. She was almost 92 years old. I was ready to let her go. And I was, it, it, she was here as long as I wanted and needed, and I thanked her in the end to say, thank you for waiting for me to grow up. Thank you so I could grow up. Thank you for letting me be the distance with you. Um, it was really amazing. And so I'm actually in the home of my birth right now um, that I haven't left yet. I still have a home in California, but I'm with family. My nephew, however, who was born on her same day, uh, just passed August 11th at 37 years old. Um, somewhat catastrophic of an unknown. I mean, nobody understood what was going on, but I look at that. My baby sister, God bless her heart. She is really, she's strong on things that are happening for her is that stream of consciousness that she doesn't even understand. That things are good that are becoming for her to carry on with his children, 10, seven, and two. And I look at that and i'm wondering if there's any addressing because the grief and i feel the grief i'm in tears probably about every day at some point mm -hmm. just realizing how connected i am with him and how i was connected and we're in kinship we have been in kinship he's important in my life and he is more difficult for me with grief than mother unless i'm combining the two so I wonder if there might be some way to address that in as far as how this whole thing works. Sure. I think there's a lot you can do. And if you think about it, it could be that it's hitting you more because of his age and he has this family and it kind of just seems so unfair and so out of order. And we, we have to look at, first of all, what is this trying to convince me of? Remember the game? Remember the instructions we read at the beginning and it says... Your ego is up to something. Mm -hmm. And even in that, and I'm not trying to minimize the experience for your family at all, because that's very tragic and hard for the family. So let's start with what is my ego trying to convince me of through this? Well, it's trying to convince me death is real. It's trying to convince me that we can have life snatched away from us, just to name a few. It's trying to convince me that children can be fatherless. They can lose their dad. It's trying to convince me that, you know, the, the mother of the family can be husbandless, that she can lose. It's trying to convince me that we are vulnerable, that life is unfair, that we are powerless, and we're just at the mercy of this or that. So it's trying to convince me just to name a few of those things. And we are not going to let that happen today. So first of all, I believe that your, um, you said this is your brother-in-law. This it's is my your... sister's uh, youngest son, my baby oh, sister. Okay. Sister's my baby youngest sister's son. Youngest son. So your nephew. 
nephew. Yes. Right. So first of all, I believe your nephew can help even in the family way, like from heaven, from right where he is. Mm -hmm. And I believe that he will make his presence very known to all of you when the grief is down. Grief is like a heavy curtain and they can't get through that. So yeah, he already has. But lay the grief down. And the reason, the way we lay it down is by remembering that death isn't real. You're just not seeing that. I mean, if you could see him right now, just sitting here talking with us, you wouldn't be grieving, you know, but he is here right now. Anytime you call to him, he's there. So, mm -hmm. and he'll tell you that one day himself. So you will know that, but you can't see that right now. And you're trusting your vision to tell you that something happened to interrupt your relationship, interrupt your life. So the first thing we just have to say no to that, that, that your nephew is with you always and forever. And he's there for the talking. And I do believe you will even hear him talk back once you get the grief out of the way. Yeah. So we have to know who he is and that he never died. And, and imagine the cartwheels he would do in heaven when you start to recognize that he's here. I feel like my, especially my parents are around here all the time. They make their presence known in so many ways. And I just think it's so lovely when, when our loved ones know that we know they're there. Imagine being a spirit and nobody knows you're there. That's got to be rough. So we're going to just know that he's here. Whenever you call to him, talk to him as if he's in the room, wish him well, tell him that you guys can use some help here and, uh, and let him help you and his family. And then the other thing we have to refuse this idea that these children could be fatherless or the, or the wife could be husbandless. We have to refuse this idea of loss and unfairness. That's what your ego is trying to get you to revalidate, breathe life into, because then the illusion can continue and more terrible things can happen. So we're just going to say no to that today. We're going to say, God, I see this situation where these children, their mother, me, myself, we all feel like we lost somebody we love, like death seemed real and feels like we're separated and that we lost something very valuable to us, but we're choosing to understand our true identity is that we are not a body. All of us, including the children, we are eternal spirit. We cannot lose with God. Loss of any kind is impossible. Thank you, God, for our eternal life and that what you created cannot be taken away. That life is not unfair because you created justice. You created fairness. You gave us everything and we cannot be without it. So I will not use this situation to convince me that what you created got messed up. I'm just going to go with what you created. And now, now I'm ready because we agree on who we are. We agree on who the children are. We agree on who the wife is. We agree on who the deceased seemingly person is. So now we have an agreement on identity. And now the Holy Spirit says, let me show you what I came to do, right? Because, and what that might look like is, you might see this family all of a sudden much lighter, happier, more fulfilled. All of a sudden the children get involved in things that really fill their heart. It could be another person comes in and, and it fills their heart with joy. It could be that the children have dreams about daddy and he's talking to them and, and it just opens their mind and heart. We don't know what it will look like. It will always be perfect for them, whatever it is. But you and I, we have to just say no to the nonsense, no to death, no to unfairness, no to being at the mercy of our circumstances. No, no ego. The answer is no, not playing the game today. No. And now Holy Spirit, you decide about all this stuff and about the kids, the wife, me, and I'm just going to choose peace just a peaceful, happy, wonderful outcome for all of us. I don't need to know how that is to be. I'm just going to know that with God, all things are possible. With God, there is no loss. With God, there is no death. And I am going to stand on our true identity because that's what brings the miracle. So I think that's what you can do and, and then step back and let God lead the way. And he's going to show you that the misery is undone. And of course, you know, we miss our people in the dream, certainly, but we're only a few bus stops behind. We're not very far, you know, I'm 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 you'll be right there and he'll be like, oh, Christy, 
<laughs> and he's going to look fabulous. Best he's ever looked in his life. So will you. And you guys will, you know, have a good hug and go, wow, that was a trip, you know, and that's it. It's okay. We're just not going to play the game with the ego. Just let God show you how this sad situation can be turned into a joyful blessing for everyone and where everyone will have their fulfillment. No one needs to fall out of love. Okay. Absolutely. You're I awesome. Look to more. God Thank bless you. you all. I love Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Oh. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.